All right. So first of all, I just want to say welcome everybody for joining us this Wednesday evening. Um, so just a little introduction. Towson Arts Collective, now going by the Arts Collective, and fondly referred to as TAC, is a nonprofit arts organization established in 2007 in Towson, Maryland. The mission of TAC is to provide a venue for artists while being an art education center. We seek to promote the growth of greater Towson's art community by combining the knowledge and energy of its residents and students with working professionals. This month, we present the exhibition Celebrating Cultures, which is on view through February 27th. Culture is the characteristics and knowledge of a particular group of people, encompassing language, religion, cuisine, social habits, music, and arts. Thus, it can be seen as the growth of a group identity fostered by social patterns unique to <laughs> If you don't mind just taking a second to mute um, until we... Uh... I might have seen you thinking about that. Thank you. Many different cultures and traditions are integral to the fabric of our community. This show is a celebration of our unique backgrounds and traditions. Tonight, we will hear from, a, from select artists who will share their inspiration behind their artwork in this exhibition. All right. So the first person that I have in the presentation is Howard. So if you wanna go ahead and unmute and uh, I have these three and then two more on the next slide. Okay. The one on the upper left is a, uh, a Japanese garden in Chinatown in Portland, Oregon. I went there about 15 years ago to visit some friends who were having a wedding. And we had the um, lunch in Chinatown and we walked around the garden. <laughs> And I just thought this was a really cool place. The second one on the right is some architecture from Turkey, Moorish designs. I changed it, I made it black and white because I thought it looked better. I love the designs, which I use a lot in my doodling drawings. And that was at Top Kapi, I think, which is a uh, castle in um, Istanbul. And the one on the bottom is on top of a Greek church walking through one of the Greek islands, I think it was called Lindos, which we took a uh, donkey to the top, which was kind of a cool thing. And I saw these bells and I thought the design was kind of interesting. Awesome. Um, and here's two more. We don't have your, your six. Uh, ah, okay, the one on the left is a synagogue in Curacao. Uh, since we do a lot of travel with Jewish. We try to go to synagogues and Jewish neighborhoods and stuff. So this is the first synagogue in the Western Hemisphere. And the floor is made out of sand, which is kind of interesting. And uh, I took a lot of pictures inside and outside. I just sort of like this one. And then the one on the right is just a colorful pattern from a building called the Dome of the Rock, which is the holiest building in Jerusalem, where uh, it's very holy for the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians. And when I was there on my honeymoon in 1971, you were allowed in. Now you're not allowed in. Now it's a Muslim site. But it's called the Dome of the Rock. It has this gold dome. And I love the colors and the patterns of the place. And inside is a big rock. The whole place is empty. All there is is a rock, which is supposedly where I think Moses stood or David. I'm not sure who. I can't remember. <laughs> but it's a very whole place. And Mohammed was there. was there. So it's a very famous place. And I think that's about it. If anybody has any questions, I don't, I'll take them. <laughs> I just have one question, Howard. Um, I know a lot of your work recently that you've been displaying in the gallery has been very colorful. In your travels, um, have you ever noticed the, the impact of what you see abroad influencing your work that you do here in home? Yes, unfortunately, the work I do at home now is mostly black and white, my drawings. But my photography I always been interested in color. I had an exhibit actually a couple of years ago. It was called Life is Color. So I will always look for intense color wherever I go. Oh, these pictures are not fixed up too much on the computer either. These actually look like that. Mm -hmm. So. Mm. So I have a question, Howard. With our um, uh, staying home, are you really, really struggling with not being able to travel? Yes, but I'm working on my doodles and 
what I'm doing now is I'm making books on my phone, would you believe? <laughs> ah. Of my photographs, there's a way to make books on your phone. And I have my travel photographs, I made a book of that. And I, I have 23,000 pictures on my computer, so I've been going through them and sending them to friends and relatives and stuff like that, you know. Trying to delete some, which is very hard, but. Yep. Well, like all but, of us trying to find the joy in quarantine. <laughs> right, it's tough, it's tough, it's tough. Thank God I have all these pictures. Keeps me yep. busy. <laughs> They're beautiful. And I have, a, I have a former student teacher of mine who helps me keep everything in order and working because I don't know how to, you know, I have all these uh, ex external hard drives to keep all the pictures on, so. But it's a lot of fun. I'm, I took pictures of the snow this week. That was about it. <laughs> And I played around with them on my computer. I have to do something next. So, because originally I taught black and white photography for 25 years. So I haven't done much black and white except recently with the snow, maybe. That's about it. Yeah, we'll be interested in seeing those for sure. What's, what's great is on the computer, you can take any picture and turn it black and white. That's what's nice. So, excellent. Any other questions for Howard before we move on? I know Norm has been to the same places where I've been, so it's kind of interesting to see his pictures. <laughs> I love the color in the of the rock, the colors of the blue. Yes, it's really an amazing place. Mm. And there's a bigger picture of it with this building has a gold dome, which is real gold. It's amazing. So, but I decided to crop it and take other pictures of it. So. <laughs> I collect tiles, so whenever we travel, I buy a lot of tiles and ceramics with all these designs on them. I have a big collection of plates and boxes and stuff with all these designs. I don't yeah. know what I'm going to do with them, but I got them. <laughs> <laughs> Howard, we were on the Dome of the Rock probably about 15 or 20 years ago, and at that time, Orthodox Jewish people did not go up, but we did right. go up, and it was all Muslim, and like you said, the uh, rock is in the middle. I know somebody took off from that rock. I, I think every culture. I think it's also where Abraham went and slew. Uh, didn't that, slew that's Abraham. it. It's, it's Abraham. It wasn't Moses. It was Abraham, right? Yep. Um, but supposedly, so, uh, I think Mohammed left from there. Or something and I think like Mohammed that. also ascended to heaven from the same spot. So you know everything. And the um, we do the same thing. We visit a lot of old synagogues. Oh so that synagogue is one we've also been to, and it's fascinating. So I think a lot of us miss the travel and love the travel. Yep. All right, excellent. So I did intersperse um, some images where people sent me information with uh, people that had RSVP'd. So our next piece is by Alice Faber. Um, so we're looking at a painting here. I will say in real life, um, the texture is very heavy, especially in the, the rock areas below the building. Um, but she wrote, the homes of wealthy Chinese families were frequently built as a series of rooms joined together by covered paths. The natural rocks, plants, and water elements that were found were incorporated in the home design and were considered as important to the residents as any single room. So kind of a appreciation for all aspects uh, in the negative spaces and the positive spaces in this culture. All right, next up we have Linda. Can you tell us about your piece? All right, um, this is titled, We Should Believe in Each Other's Dreams. And um, I, th I have uh, collections of all kinds of things in boxes and bins. And I was just noticing that I had a lot of objects from different cultures. So that was kind of in my brain. And then um, someone gave me those little Asian slippers for a birthday present. How cool was that? And as soon as I was given those slippers, I was like, oh, I've got to do something now. And then I heard that line, we should believe in each other's dreams. I should write down where I get them from. I don't recall if it was from a poem or a 
song or what. Um, and as often typical with me, the things start coming together. You know, the intention, I don't, I, I maybe was starting to, I mean, I, I had been gathering objects from different cultures, but it wasn't until I understood what my story was going to be, what my intention was, that I actually would start. Uh, I found that box someplace at a flea market or something. I don't know what it was for because it's just got these odd little compartments and some protruding shapes. And I always enjoy that challenge of, of working with what's there. I don't um, try to hide the fact that it's a box. Um, I sort of think of the of uh, Louise Nevelson, who said she feels like she's giving the objects a second life, a new story. So, um, right. Uh, so I just um, started gathering. And I think what pushed me was our time in that uh, the news to me was just breaking my heart and the diversity uh, all around us. And, you know, I truly believe we need to support each other and believe in each other. And so um, I tried to represent as many cultures as I could. And um, a little interesting note is the little footprint on the left is my daughter's who's from Chile. And that was her birth announcement. <laughs> So she's included. And then right next to it is my uh, nephew's wife is Eastern Indian. And that's from their wedding where she had the henna on her hands. So um, yeah, things just sort of start fitting in the compartments. And sometimes it's a little scary. I think they come to me when I need them. <laughs> So I, I'm, it's very busy, but I'm excited about it. And I think, I feel that um, the intention was we should believe in each other's dreams. And I felt that by putting all these different uh, artifacts from a variety of cultures and having them all work together in a unified composition was kind of symbolic for what I feel can happen in our world. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting to hear how you included um, like these personal things too with your own exposure to, to other cultures and how they affect your life. Any questions for Linda? I'm amazed about all. Oh. I'm amazed with all this stuff you collect, though. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's one of the first questions that people usually ask. Where do you get your stuff? <laughs> right. Do you go to flea markets at all and stuff? I, I do sometimes go to flea markets and little antique shops. Um, uh, you know, I've been doing this for quite a few years, so I have a pretty extensive collection. Um, and uh, truly, during this pandemic, everybody's been cleaning and purging. And I'll get a phone call from someone that'll say, Linda, I cleaned out my basement and I've got a bag of stuff that I don't want. And I thought of you. So <laughs> I take that in a positive way. <laughs> Great. And I think it's good for that person too, because then they imagine that their their trash is going to be used in a piece of artwork, which it is. Excellent, yeah. Certainly giving it that second life you spoke of. Beautiful, yeah, that's a very thorough explanation of your process and the, the, the your thinking with this piece. Thank you. It reminds me of Joseph Cornell. I don't know if you know who he is. Yes. Uh, guy who did. I used to teach this project in school. <laughs> Joseph Cornell boxes. Yeah. I was, well, actually, yeah. actually, my very first assemblage was a prototype for a lesson at school. 
and I, the student problem was to uh, use found objects to create a uh, portrait of a person that you've had a long-term relationship with. The kids were working on these real intense drawings and I wanted to show them that there was another way to create a portrait. And as soon as I made my first one, I was hooked. I fell in love with the process. That's fantastic. So. Mm -hmm. Howard, you hit the, the nail on the head there with Joseph Cornell. I was thinking that uh, the little bird in the upper right-hand corner uh, mm -hmm. reminded me directly of one of his pieces with a similar bird. Awesome. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Linda. We'll move on Thank to the you. artist. All right, so this is a new artist for the gallery. Um, Andrada Gallery is, is what they like to go by. Um, and just a quick comments for each of these. Um, the image on the left, Whirling Dervish. She wrote, I am fascinated by the ability of the Whirling Dervish to meditate in the midst of such intense physical activity. And for the centerpiece, uh, Oriental Dreams. She wrote, the struggle to balance the traditional with the modern is an internal one. And for the last painting, Andes, she wrote, truly captivating is the extent to which this young Bolivian girl and her baby alpaca are perfectly at ease with each other. All right, so Andrada Gallery pulling from several different uh, cultural influences. Nancy Fischel's up next. Um, we have these two digital pieces followed by a larger painting. Okay, um, these, these two pieces were um, inspired by my final trip before we weren't allowed to travel anymore. And that's when I went to Baja, California. And I went to see the whales, which I did see, but also there was one evening that high school kids did um, some dances for us. And so I sat down on the floor um, down in front of everybody else and just clicked away. And I love the motion and the movement and the joy that they had in their dancing and with we, each other. So um, it was really um, fun to see how they were willing and happy to share their culture and their dances with the people that came off of all of the cruise ships on, I'm guessing, a regular basis. And, you know, they, they just had so much fun doing it and with each other. Um, and I think I just saw today that um, another organization is also celebrating these same dances. So it's interesting that it's a culture that is prevalent in Baltimore as well as its traditional areas in Mexico. So um, that's what both of these were from. So it was two different dances. And I've used them to inspire some other pieces too. So, you know, as uh, that was my final trip, I'm pulling a lot of images from that trip to be able to show my work. Um, like Howard, I use a lot of my travel pieces as my inspirations. There's a lot of movement in these tears. Uh, what, what is, what is meant by a digital painting? Can you tell us that process? I do these on my iPad. So what I do is I um, actually take multiple photographs. The one on the left probably had three to four photographs and I layer them on top of each other digitally in a program called Procreate, which I think is a hilarious name of a program, but it seems <laughs> to be the... Um, the standard now for drawing on iPads. And it's um, also uh, compatible with Photoshop. Um, and then what I do is I figure out where everything's gonna go after I layer everything in. And then I draw on top of that. And then I um, go and decide what to use, decide what to not to use, what to add, what to do a riff on and um, then I lose all the photographs and I leave what's there. 
So you, there's a lot of different brushes you can use. There's a lot of different techniques, which I have just begun to discover. Um, but um, they, I find that these are also really good practices for me for some of my paintings. I get to do a lot of planning and a lot of looking and, I, and much of my work is dealing with movement, um, which is harder to do in the last year because we don't see people <laughs> too often. But um, you know, that, that's what I've been really fascinated with, with my work. Thank you for the question. I'm a, I, you have a lot more patience than I to do to do this on an iPad. I tried, I gave up. <laughs> I, get, I get bored watching TV. So um, I watch TV and I have the iPad in my lap and I often have more than one going at the same time. And yeah, they do take a good number of hours to do each one of them. They take some of my simpler, Ones might take two hours, but some of the more complex ones may take more up to eight. So mm -hmm. it depends on which one I'm doing and what I decide to do with it. Some I've been trying to force the painterliness more than the realism, um, and sometimes it's successful, and sometimes the realism works better for a specific piece. I think it would look cool without the people's heads and feet. Uh huh. Then you there's really get an abstract a, painting. <laughs> I always used to say to my kids, there's always a next. Right. And actually the one on the right today, I started printing um, three a set of uh, triptych of blocks based on that piece and the painting that I did from oh. it. That is very abstract. It's mostly the swirls. You have to kind of look to figure out that it's people. So some of it is going that way. But the ink's still wet on that one. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for explaining the, the digital painting process. It's a beginning. All right, and Nancy, you also have this piece? Yep, Th this is one that definitely grew out of the pandemic. Um, I, along with a lot of other things, I collect masks when I travel. Um, so I have a whole wall of masks in my room. And um, earlier in the spring and summer, I would think of a theme in my head every day and I would go out and do my walk, but there were rainy days too. So there were days that I took photographs of things in my home as well. And one of the days I decided to take photographs of a lot of the masks. And um, then I was thinking about the fact that we're all wearing masks on a daily basis, at least when we leave our homes. So I wanted to do something that commented upon the fact of those masks. Um, so I, took a lot of the photographs I had taken of my own masks. I collaged them together and then I made a complete painting. And I realized, which I didn't do on purpose at first, um, the balance of the fish in this painting. And I also was fascinated by the eyes that continually looked out at you, even though you're hiding your identity behind the masks, uh, that patterning of eyes across the painting really started to mesmerize me. Um, there's, there's a lot of cultures in there. Um, the one in the center is a Inuit style, style mask that was made by a Klingit. The one on the left of that is a Klingit inspired mask that is a glass mask made by a Californian. The one on top is from the Mardi Gras. The two white ones are African. The one with the terracotta on it was from a potter in Cuba. Um, and there's three masks, four masks that are from Bali. Um, and the last mask was one brought to me because people know I collect masks that was woven in Panama. So it was really talking about how cultures use masks for different things. And I kept on discovering more and more as I did the painting, which took a long time. This was a, what is a 40 by 30, so it was a fairly good sized piece. Awesome, yeah, it's interesting to hear all the different cultures um, that use masks for those different reasons. Any and the reasons are all different too. I mean, each one of them has symbolic representations, um, some more than others. 
but it all means something. You've got the Balinese masks that are demon masks. The one on the lower right is used in a dance. And so that's a specific character. Um, the one in the center is a dream mask and it deals with going back and forth between the dream worlds. Um, some of them, I think, you know, like Mardi Gras mask is mostly dealing with celebration. So there's a lot of different reasons why people use masks. And even with the, in the Balinese, there's a variety. But what was, what was fascinating is when I got those, we went to a shop in, in Bali. Every town has a specialty. So we had the wood carving town and then there was the mask maker who was also a priest. So before we were allowed to buy masks, he had to come by and talk to us and give us permission to buy the masks that we eventually ended up getting. So the, the whole process was really fascinating. Well, I'll have to show you my collection of masks when we could get out and go to people's houses. <laughs> that sounds perfect. I actually am thinking about another kind of painting that's similar to this that I may do in the future. So we'll see what happens. We always have to, like I said, go and think about the next as well as where we were. Well put. All right, uh, so moving on, we also have uh, Norm Dubbin, who's here with us tonight with a little kitty cat I saw. <laughs> uh, Norm, I have what you sent me, the text. Um, I can read that unless you wanna just go ahead and, and freely talk about these. Um, yeah, well, I didn't really prepare very much, I'm sorry to say, but uh, essentially, um, I, I was trying to obscure the differences of pe uh, people, um, <clears throat> uh, the people in these Paint, paint our um, photographs um, are all students or uh, people in the school where my wife taught. Uh, and she taught in a lot of the city schools. Uh, she taught ESOL. In fact, she's sitting right here. I don't know if she's going to show herself. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and um, so I started just by making a collage of uh, the students and maybe there's some faculty in there also, but they're from all different cultures, but I tried to obscure their skin color uh, just to uh, emphasize the uh, universal humanity of uh, all different cultures. And, and the technique I've used is um, I, I've done this with using a blending mode. Uh, in Photoshop, which is essentially used for editing photographs or retouching them or um, it, restoring old photographs. And it's done just by uh, layering uh, two of the same photographs on top of each other and the blending mode works using algorithms that compare and contrast uh, different colors or tones using uh, uh, the color identity number. If you know what that is, it's usually a, a series of two digit numbers that say, that define what the color is, but that's besides the point. Uh, anyway, I, I'm I'm using it by putting different pictures together, and uh, 
using the blending mode in that fashion. So it's not exactly what it was made to be used for, but I find it very useful. And sometimes it comes out with some interesting uh, compositions. Yes, yeah, so how many, um, I just have a question then, because these are built upon so many different layers of not only the imagery, but also the color and the other um, filters you're using, how many layers typically go into one of these uh, um, photo montages? Two at a time, <laughs> two at a time, that's, that's it. and sometimes I'll, uh, fuse those layers into one and then maybe put another one on top of that, but you can only work with two at a time. Well, I look at them without my glasses on and I see these beautiful color designs. That's the best way. And uh, it, looks like an <laughs> it looks like an abstract painting. It's really nice. <laughs> There's a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. in them. I see uh, Barry has his uh, magnifying glass up. Um, <laughs> so these are all on the website as well. The entire exhibition is on uh, www.towsonartscollective.org um, where you can click on each one of these individually and see them a little bit larger. Did you say you're gonna have a YouTube of this whole thing tonight? Um, I can play that. Uh, um, Richard put together a video with sound where he goes and looks at each one. So we can play that at the end if, if we have interest. Now I'm talking about what we're doing now. Oh yes, we'll put this on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I find it? Uh, we have a YouTube channel. So I will um, send that out with our um, newsletter. I will okay. Because mm -hmm. my daughter wanted to watch it now, but she was at a meeting, so. Oh, okay, yeah, it'll be available. Good. Mm -hmm. I also <clears throat> wanted to say that most of the stuff you people have seen are my uh, either collages or photo montages, but I also do black and white. And um, in fact, this morning I went for a walk and took some black and white photographs on um, the Gwynn's Falls Trail at Milford Mill, if anybody knows where that is. It's a pretty obscure trail. But uh, I've posted it on um, Facebook if you want to go on and uh, just look at my timeline, you can see it there. But you can can see I just do black and white also, even though when I do the black and white, I usually overexpose it and maybe do some other changes with it as well. Increase the contrast, for instance. Yeah, always through the, the artist's eye. <laughs> what kind of computer do you use? What, type, what kind of a computer? Yeah, is yours on a Mac? I have a, or a... No, oh, a PC. Okay. So yours is PC, okay. Dell computer. Excellent. So any more questions for Norm? If not, we can go on. All right, thank you so much, Norm. Uh, Kathleen, you're up next. I see you've got your, your dog with you there as well. <laughs> One of them, the other one's complaining she's not in my lap. <laughs> um, as I said, my family traveled and I have all these things and I just thought I would combine them all and then have fun with the ph photography. So, um, all right, should I say what I wrote or? or? Um, sure, well, we have this slide and this slide, um, but. 
Okay. Um, well, the one on the right is in the Grenadines when I was there, and we were walking back from the grocery store, walking down the country road to go back to the sailboat. And um, I had my phone then, which was the best phone, and that phone is now at the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay. So, <laughs> um, but I, I put it on a thingy that by accident, and I got this photograph. So I'm honest about it. <laughs> And then um, it was just, we, the grocery store was in the middle of the countryside and very basic and not, you know, we just could get what we could get. And, and then um, the one up on the upper left, I have that little Chinese, I have two of those little wooden dolls. My grandfather was head of 20th Century Fox in South America. And then his sister-in-law, my great aunt was in the foreign service and they would run into each other, say in Japan or something like that. But um, so that's why I have different things. And then I thought um, a totally different thing, the one on the bottom, dogs are their own culture and they show us into theirs. Obviously I'm a dog person and I do whimsical things, but that's just another hidden life, animals. And especially in this, the way we're all by ourselves, we appreciate our animals and their little lives. And, and a little aside, if I say the word M-O-U-S-E to one of my dogs, she pretends she's a cat and she just zips from the first floor to the second. And she's like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So, Here's your uh, PNC. Uh, okay. Shh. I'm gonna put that with your mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, Kathleen, what are the um? What's the pic photo on the left? The left. Can you talk about that? Um, one Peruvian in, in Peru. People walking in Peru, and the piece of jewelry. The two pieces of jewelry, are, I think, are Peruvian. I could be wrong, but but um, I have the photographs here, but. In Peru, is um, or oh, someone had the um, the llama or the in the other one, um, but they had their wonderful hats and in all these things. So excellent. So it sounds like a you collected these items. You said because your family would travel, and then you would travel. Well, they collected them, right, right, mm -hmm. and I just kept them. <laughs> <clears throat> I like the collage effect you get. Oh, thank you. It's it's not my. I did something different, you know, from my usual thing. So, and it was fun. Yeah, you can tell you you've had a lot of fun, and I always uh, like when you include. Um, your your dogs and your pieces as well. It is an interesting. I mean, culture, thinking enough like about other people and other groups. Um, yeah, dogs can certainly have their own kind of uh, communities and uh, different viewpoints. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Grace, for for doing everything you've done for us. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. continuing to be a part of Tech. Well, you've done so much. Thank you. You have a very unique voice in your work. Oh, really? Thank I think so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the picture on the right, is that a painting or a photograph? I'm not sure. It's a photograph. But you changed it, obviously. I. It was an accident with the phone. You, but you did that on the phone by accident? Yes. That's incredible. All right. <laughs> I don't right. know what program. As, well, I don't know because I fell off a boat up in, um, in the Chesapeake Bay and that phone is at the bottom and the fish are using it now. And it was the best phone I had. <laughs> Fantastic, because I blow it up and I can see so much detail, it's amazing, so. <laughs> yeah. I have some more of from that trip of um, goats on a beach because they're the natural um, lawn mowers on islands. And if you attach, if you put a goat at a stake, that goat won't run away. It'll munch away 
and it's the grass, and it, it can have a companion goat, and that companion goat will not leave that other one, so they don't both have to be tied. So then you, oops. We can still hear you. Oh, now you're muted. Oh, Kathleen, you're muted now. All right. So I have a photograph in this this method, this way of the goat and boats in the hood. And then I have a photograph of a um of a lonely beer can. It was an American beer can on an island, on that island that was so pristine. <laughs> <clears throat> Any more questions for Kathleen before we move on? All right. Well, thank you, Kathleen, for including your pieces in the show. Thank you. Okay. So these pieces um, I've included from Mary Reaver um, because she she put it very simply. She said, "What kind of, like what's a really fun culture like?" Just think about people that enjoy drinking and smoking. So <laughs> we've included, um, she has these uh, vintage smoking pipes in the left um, and then these uh, miniature uh, scotch um, containers on the right. And I, when I spoke with her, she said that um, the smoking pipes are from Germany. So we have uh, different countries represented as well. Okay. Um, so now I've included the piece that I've included in the show. So this is my own. And um, I included it because of its um, association with cookouts that uh, my friends and I would have. Um, so pictured here, we have kind of a, a typical uh, weekend scene outside nighttime, um, the, the camping chairs, um, and then this individual with uh, just typical dress for, for people I associate with. So um, you got the Converse shoes and the, the natty bow in her hand. Um, I think that's a, a Miller High Life in, in the, um, the arm of that as well. Um, so I thought that'd be appropriate um, to include for the culture show. Uh, oh, but I am the artist, so any any questions? Or... So Grace, were you, I don't. Grace, were you more interested in young adult culture or American culture when you did this? Um, well, I would guess I would say my own culture. Um, so things that that me and my group would kind of typically do. Um, but uh, oh, that's my dog barking. But um, I also wanted to um, combine both like the contemporary and the classical. So I'd used a, a central composition, um, strong uh, light and shadow. And then um, also at this time, I was using a very limited palette. So this entire painting is painted with a black, a white, uh, red and yellow, so no other uh, colors um, outside of those four. I was just going to mention the color in your picture was very unusual. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, you can get a really incredible range with just using a limited palette, uh, but it does give an overall kind of uh, harmony that tends to be a little um, like more muted and duller and, and be more tonal than, than colorful. Almost like a hand painted photograph. Mm, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, Grace, are you working from a photograph or do you actually do sketches on the spot or paint on the spot? Um, so this this was a combination of both a photo reference and painting from life. Um, so I would, and that's something that I, I still do um, today just out of what's convenient. Um, however, painting from life, I think there's just so much more information that you have to work from. Um, so this, I started out with a photo reference and then once I was finishing up just to get kind of the final details and 
um, sense of it. I, I did paint from life as well. <laughs> <laughs> She's really it's like she a big bark. bark. <laughs> sounds like my little dog. <laughs> Yeah, but thank you for your question, Howard and Linda. <coughs> All right, so I'm moving on for just our last piece now that I've included. Um, I just like I'm blown away by the the color in this, and it's a it's pastel, and this is by an artist, Nancy Fine, who's not present tonight, but I will read to you what she wrote. Um, and she wrote, my family are multi-generational watermen and water women, earning a livelihood from the water. This is an oyster tonger. Some watermen still harvest oysters this way. Grandfather and great-grandfather caught the menhaden and lived on the boats and followed the schools of fish. My family are multi-generational watermen and women, earning a livelihood from the water. I think I copied and pasted that twice. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a, a traditional way of harvesting oysters that she's illustrated. There's um, so much energy in it because of her strokes. Mm -hmm. Very, in the color contrast, it's all very exciting. Yes, I will agree. The color in this is, is really incredible. Um, it, it feels warm. Mm -hmm. I remember being out on the water early in the morning and watching all the crabbers and the oysters down on the eastern shore. So, and I, I've done watercolor paintings of oyster tongers, so it just brings back a lot of feeling to me. So, and the sun rising there and It's a lot of work what to do. <laughs> That's incredible that you've uh, kind of witnessed this exact scene. Yes. All right, um, so that concludes the presentation. Um, if artists, other artists had jumped in that um, I didn't include, we could look at the, the website. Um, so let me go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, so thank just, you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> just to um, summarize also really quickly, um, to view the exhibition as well as a video um, walkthrough to music that Richard Dinges has put together for us, you can visit uh, www.towsonartscollective.org um, slash celebrating hyphen cultures, uh, but there's also a link to it on the homepage. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. All right, thank you.